Welcome to the Central Pennsylvania Real Estate Investors Meetup Podcast, keeping you up to date with what is happening in the York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania real estate markets. Welcome to the Central Pennsylvania Real Estate Investors Meetup Podcast. My name is Chad Eisenhart. Each week, I go to all the local real estate meetups in York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and rebroadcast them in their entirety. Whether you're a new real estate investor just looking to get started, or you have 100 doors, Real estate meetups are a great place to find like-minded individuals, including buying and selling your deals. I'm a buy and hold real estate investor focused on single family, multifamily, and self storage in York, PA. You can find me at chadbuys.com. This week, I'm at the Real Estate Investors Meetup of York, hosted by Dave Heisen and Harry Nail. The speaker is Kevin Eisenhart with Eisenhart & Company, CPA and Business Advisors. Kevin discusses tax brackets and moving to the next bracket, tax rates for flipping versus buy and hold, the benefits of using professional to do your taxes versus yourself, the home office deduction, should you worry about an IRS deduction, being a real estate professional, the benefits of cash versus accrual method for accounting, cost segregation, bonus depreciation, and proper record keeping. And now on to this week's episode. Thanks. I want to welcome everybody to the, tonight's meeting. We have a, uh, a really good meeting because everybody wants to learn how to save money on their taxes, right? Yeah. So uh, my CPA, Kevin Eisenhart, is going to go uh, give us all the ninja tax tips. Right, Kevin? You got it. <laughs> my name is Harry Now. I'm your host. Uh, my co-host, Dave, is in sunny Florida. He said it was 86 degrees there today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me find the clicker. Ah, there it is. We formed this meeting to be able to help people get their business up and running in real estate. And we would like everybody to become a member. Some of the benefits are networking. Networking is literally the lifeblood of small businesses because you get together with like-minded people, people doing the same type of business, whether they're doing 20 houses a year or two houses a year, or maybe it's their first one, they're just getting an education. This is the place to come to and network and rub elbows with, with some of the players. I've done business at the Lancaster Group the Harrisburg Group and the York Group. And I've built some relationships. Uh, I met Judah, who runs the Harrisburg Group. Say hi, Judah. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry, I get deal flowing out there. I'm trying to save you. No, no, that's all right. Uh, you got to save those deals. <laughs> and he runs the Harrisburg Group. That's kind of our sister group. And uh, that's another great group to go to. Matter of fact, their meeting is on the fourth Thursday, which is this coming Thursday. So if anybody was not here last month and missed the presentation that I did on how to find contractors, how to keep them happy, how to take an average contractor, contractor and make them a good contractor, and the six critical documents you really need to use every time you do a real estate transaction. If you missed that last month, I'll be doing that for Judah's group in Harrisburg this Thursday. Uh, see us afterwards and we'll tell you. It's at the Red Line Hotel, starts at seven. Who all was here last month? Let me see some hands. Was that a great, great meeting? A lot of good content? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, so this Thursday in Harrisburg. You're not just, you don't just meet real estate investors here, but you can meet attorneys, lenders, uh, contractors, because everybody's always looking for contractors. I'm actually surprised more contractors don't come to these meetings because they could get a ton of business. So if you know any contractors who are looking for business, have them come to the meeting. Education. We always have a speaker and it's always real estate related. Next month, uh, my attorney, Kurt Blake, will be here talking about uh, some tenant-landlord relations and some new laws that just came into effect. So mark it on your calendar for next month as well. 
You told me that you're really a bad golfer too, by the way, Kevin. What's that? Kurt. Yeah. Blake, you said you're a really bad golfer. I don't know why. <laughs> what you meant by that. Apparently you guys were golfing together not too long ago. I, I beat him, so I think oh, he's, you just, beat he's him. still sore. <laughs> I can't believe he lied to me like that. Wow. <laughs> One of the benefits of joining is you get our lease. Our lease was approved and adopted by the Attorney General of Pennsylvania. So no matter what magistrate you go into, if you have a case against a tenant, <clears throat> that lease is going to be accepted. And not only accepted, it's going to be recognized. And there's very little arguing that the magistrate could do against your lease. I've seen some really bad leases that people are using still today. And you, you got to stop using them bad leases. So we have a great lease. Another benefit is we, we're members of PROA. PRO is an acronym, and that is uh, our lobbying group that fights anti-landlord laws. Cities, municipalities, townships, sometimes they are cash strapped, sometimes they're, you know, they think landlords have deep pockets. And a lot of times they'll enact ordinances that are not very uh, landlord friendly. And I always use the Millersville, for example, in Lancaster County. Millersville tried to enact a 35 hour just for signing a lease tax. So every time you sign a lease, they're gonna whack you 35 bucks for no reason. But so pro attorneys came in to town and they defeated that. So $38 of the membership goes to PROA. And we feel we need to give back to the people who are fighting for, for our livelihood. And that's not much money to, to give back, but it all adds up. Personal growth and motivation. And you get to hang out with us. So that's really the best benefit of all. Invite guests, anybody that is a landlord. Everybody thinks they know everything about real estate because they've been doing it for 20, 30 years. And let me tell you what, I look at their leases, they don't have a lead-based paint disclosure signed. There's just a lot of mistakes that if something happens and they have to go to court, they're in trouble. So you want to stay abreast of new, new laws that are coming into effect. Again, next month, be here. We do have some sponsors, Slate House Group, uh, and Judah just is out there working that deal property managers, Frank's Granite and Marble, and they do have contractor packages as well for flippers. Darren, Anchor Abstract. Mark, where are you at? Oh, Mark back there, Miracle Method. Mark just did a job for me <coughs> down on Reynolds Mill Road, uh, I don't know, six unit apartment building, and they, everyone has a green tub. They were built like around 1970. And so as people move out, they go in and they spray them and make them all pretty and white and everything. 20 second commercial. This is your elevator pitch and this is for members only. We are going to uh, forgo that just because the crowd's so big today and we have a lot of good content we wanna go over. But uh, everyone needs to learn to do a good elevator pitch. And it needs to be concise People need to know exactly what you do when you're finished with your elevator pitch. And it should be something like, hi, my name's Harry Nail. I've been in real estate for 34 years as a realtor. I've been flipping for about 12 years and uh, we own a bunch of rental properties. So anything with real estate, you have any needs, any questions, uh, feel free to call me. I'm also a national training coach with Fortune Builders for seven years. So anything with real estate, give me a call. And you see how you, you know exactly what I do and what I'm looking for. And that's, that should be practice. You should develop your pitch and practice that. So every time you meet somebody, you can use that pitch. Jeff, I see you shaking your head. You use yours, right? I know you do. Let me hear yours real quick. I'm with Integrity Properties in, out of Hanover, Pennsylvania. What I do is I work with, with our 
buyers can help them achieve their dream of home ownership regardless of their financial background or credit history. But important to each of us here is that I work with our buyers to help them get rid of their property as easy as possible. And I'm good at creative financing, so if you have any kind of creative situations that you need some help with, um, give me a call, 717-870-7943. Instead, you'd be handing them a business card, though, right? Yes. You want to keep it 20 seconds or less because after 20 seconds, you start to lose people. <clears throat> Most people's attention spans aren't that long, especially millennials. We're going to have our speaker come up <clears throat> in a second here. Uh, I've known Kevin for about four or five years. Uh, I had a CPA before and he uh, was not doing a very good job. And it's amazing the difference between my old CPA and Kevin. And you really don't even realize there's, there, there, there's that much of a difference until you actually switch. So if you're using somebody that maybe is not a pro, is not you know, doing what you think they should be, go see somebody else, talk to them. You'll be amazed. Uh, uh, how much money uh, a good CPA can save you. Kevin, and he, oh, he just opened up his own uh, firm. So uh, yeah. let's give Kevin a big hand. Thank you. Stay there. All right, let me just get this set up here real quick. <clears throat> Hopefully your attention spans a little longer than 20 seconds. It's going to take a little bit more to go through what I got here today. Um, I'm also, uh, that's not going to work. We'll just have to deal with it. That's going to drive me crazy the whole time, but we'll manage through it. Is there a way to like get it so it's... <laughs> now nah, we're cooking. That's perfect. Thank you. So as Harry said, my name's Kevin Eisenhart. Um, I, I did just open a new firm, Eisenhart & Company. Uh, we're in, in downtown New York, uh, off Queen Street. Uh, we work with clients very similar to all of you, you know, in the small business community. Uh, we do a lot with construction and real estate clients. That's our, our primary, uh, you know, sector. But, um, you know, as a firm here practicing in central Pennsylvania, I mean, we'll do, you know, manufacturing, distribution, service, retail, uh, you know, pretty much the whole nine yards uh, we do. In addition to tax consulting, tax preparation, we also do financial statements for some clients, uh, reviewed and compiled financial statements. And so, again, a, a fairly uh, traditional CPA firm uh, with, with, like I said, a, a wide mix of services. Um, you know, Harry asked me to come here tonight and talk to you guys a little bit about taxes and, and ways that you can save taxes. And so I, I was going to spend a little bit of time just kind of going through uh, some of the 2019 tax highlights, um, talk about some things that changed. Uh, we're here now in year two, or coming up on year two of, you know, the, the big tax law change that happened. Uh, and so, um, you know, just kind of wanted to talk to people about that as we're still, people are still trying to learn and figure out kind of how it all works. Um, and so I wanted to just talk a little bit about that. I have some planning ideas in here. Um, but it was, it's, it's really, you know, meant to be kind of an open dialogue. So if you hear something, you have a question, just stop me. Um, if, if I don't cover something that you want to talk about, uh, you know, ask me a question and I'll, I'll do my best. You know, I see people got some drinks, so that's good. I mean, if you have to go out and get another drink because the other presentation, you know, feel free. It's not going to hurt my feelings uh, at all. All right, so again, I, I talked a little bit about at the beginning just saying about this tax law change. So, um, you know, in, back in December of 2017, believe it or not, it seems like ages ago, you know, the president, um, you know, gave everybody a nice big Christmas gift when he, um, you know, passed this, this new tax bill that it's, was called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and so it's funny because, you know, w when you read and you hear and like now again, we've, we've gone through a, a tax season with that, um, you know, tax law in effect. Um, you know, some people were looking at it and say, well, gosh, you know, I, I didn't uh, pay less taxes this year. It really didn't feel like a tax cut for me, but anytime they pass a tax bill, you have to kind of give it a fancy name, something that makes you feel good and, and, and sounds nice. So this one was called the Tax Cuts and, and Jobs Act of 2017. Um, 
it represents what we feel is, is one of the most significant tax law changes probably since the, you know, the Tax Reform Act of 1986. So really you're, you're, you're dealing with 30 years of legislation. Um, you know, and a number of the provisions that were part of that Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, were, are temporary. Um, and I think it's important to understand that distinction. Sometimes people don't realize that. So when a tax law gets passed, it's either um, permanent law, meaning that unless Congress does something, that's going to be what's in effect. Or it's a temporary change, meaning that at some point that law is going to sunset and Congress has to do something to keep it in effect, otherwise it kind of reverts back to old law. Uh, and so a lot of the individual provisions were temporary. Um, some of the corporate tax changes were permanent. And so I think it's important as you start to think and plan um, to understand that difference because we could be, you know, you know, like I said in this slide, December 31st, 2025, which seems like a long way off, but it'll be here before you know it. We could find ourselves revert, reverting back to old tax law. And if that happens, um, you know, tax rates could be higher. And so some people have started rethinking that whole strategy of, hey, let's kick that proverbial can down the road as far as we can, right? Def defer, 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 defer. Um, because the concern is, hey, if in 2025, you know, tax rates are 40% again, you know, that's not going to be good when these, de you know, depreciation and things like that start to reverse. You know, maybe now is a good time to pay, to pay some tax. Um, and that's usually when I get booed and kick kicked off the stage, you know. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's just, it's just something to think about as, as, you, as you approach taxes. Again, it's, it's, you got to take the long view. You can't just look at one year in isolation. And I, I feel like if we don't kind of have that conversation, I'd be doing you a disservice by not at least like bringing that up and just, again, making a, a conscious decision to say, hey, you know, here's our, here's our strategy, here's what we're going to do for the long term. So I put in here some, some tax rate brackets. Um, and I don't know if, if these slides will be available, but I'll certainly give them to Dave and, and Harry, and they can post them wherever you guys post stuff. And you, know, you can certainly use them. These, these brackets, here's the single, here's the married. They look a lot like the brackets of 2018. Uh, they're a little bit bigger um, in terms of the dollar amount. A lot of times these things get indexed for inflation. Sorry, it's a little hard to read. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of the main things that you need to see here. Um, wh what I think the big takeaways are with, when it comes to tax rates, tax brackets, I always get a lot of questions from clients that will call me and say, hey, how much can I make before I'm in the next tax bracket? Everybody wants to always know that, right? And I think I get that question a lot because there's some confusion on how the tax system works. So I'll just kind of, as we talk about a little bit of education, just kind of talk about how, how it works. So our U.S. tax system is a graduated tax system, meaning that as you work your way up through these brackets, I don't know if this works, yeah, it does. You know, the first so many dollars of income is taxed at 10%. The next so much is taxed at 12, then 22, then 24, et cetera, et cetera. So just because you get into the next tax bracket, doesn't necessarily mean all your income is going to be subject to that higher rate. And I think that's what people think. And so when you talk about tax rate, there's your marginal rate. In other words, if I make an extra dollar, how much tax am I going to have to pay on that extra dollar? That's where tax brackets are meaningful. And then there's, a, your, there's your effective tax rate, meaning if I take all my income divided by, or I'm sorry, my tax that I pay divided by all my income, what rate am I paying tax? And so I think I don't get as hung up on what, where brackets end. Uh, there are some situations where you maybe want to plan around trying to stay within a certain bracket, um, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But again, I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind, that it is graduated, right? So it's not, if, it's not the end of the world if you get into the next, the next tax bracket. Some things in, in tax rules kick in at certain income levels, um, and so that's really where I think it's more critical to plan around, like, okay, what income level do I need to stay at to make sure I'm able to maximize you know, certain tax benefits that are out there. So before I get to the next slide, how many people have heard of the fact that there's a preferential rate for long-term capital gains? Anybody ever hear that before? Yeah, everybody's hand should be up, right? Anybody that's in real estate knows that there's a preferential tax rate for long-term capital gains. Does anybody know what that rate is? 19. What is it? 19. Harry says 19. Anybody have another guess? 10%. 10, 15? Okay. All right. Well, it depends, right? The answer is it depends. So there's actually three potential long-term capital gain tax rates, okay? And long-term meaning greater than a year. Um, and it depends on your filing status, and it depends on how much income you have. So 
a correct answer for a long-term capital gains tax rate is actually zero, right? So if your income is low enough, you could actually pay 0% of your long-term capital gains. So how does that happen? Well, let's just say you, know, you have a business that has a, has a down year and you generate a loss. Or you, you, know, you, you buy a new piece of real estate and you take advantage of accelerated depreciation and you're able to, to deduct that loss and that, again, drives down your income. Sometimes some planning strategy around that is, OK, are there capital gains that we could potentially harvest and get no pay no long-term capital gains tax on it because we're in the 0% tax bracket. So th these numbers kind of look weird, but if, let's just go back here to our tax table, right? If you're in the 12% you're in the tax bracket, as long as your income, again, taxable income, doesn't exceed 78,950. Well, prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the highest long-term capital gains tax rate was 15%. And so the reason for the 0% rate is like, well, what's the incentive for somebody? How is it a preferential rate when you're already in a, a lower tax bracket? So if you're less than 15% on your regular income, your long-term capital gains tax rate is zero. If you're married filing joint and you um, have income, taxable income between 78,750 and 488,849, these are numbers for 2019, your tax rate, your tax rate is going to be 15%. Again, going back to our tax rate, that means that you can be somewhere in the 35% marginal tax bracket and have a 15% long-term capital gains tax rate. So when somebody calls me and says, hey, I had this big capital gain event, that's something that we're going to look at to say, okay, well, how can we keep your income? Are there things that we can do? Or is there accelerated depreciation that we can take? Are there accounting methods that we should change to try to make sure we keep your income below this 488, 849? Because if we don't, then that's going to cost you an extra 5% once you exceed that because um, it's going to bump you up to the next tax, tax bracket. And then, of course, anybody that's over 488850, you're paying a 20% long-term capital gains tax rate because, again, you're going to be in that 35, 37, um, you know, marginal tax bracket in, in here. So, again, I don't think it's as, it's as critical to, to, to worry about, but I do think having an understanding of what it means as you work your way up through those income levels and how that can affect other aspects of your taxes is important. Um, I put the single rates in there as well. Again, it just depends on what your filing status is. Um, and again, these rate thresholds are also indexed for uh, inflation. Does that make sense? Um, all right, I wanted to just talk about the standard deduction here just for a minute because most of us, I would think, file taxes personally, at least you should. Um, and um, a lot of folks that have you know, real estate businesses um, are, are organized in such a way where all the income kind of flows through and gets taxed on you know, your personal tax return. And so personal taxes are an important component of how you know, your business is ultimately um, taxed. Because as the individual, you're going to bear that tax burden. There, there's a lot of misconception with this tax, tax law change about simplification. Right, that was kind of a big, big push. You know, a lot of the politic around it was we were going to have a postcard size tax return, and, and in fact, even if you look at the returns, they're kind of form fitted so that they ultimately could fit on a postcard. But, but that doesn't mean it's more simple. What what happened was they made the, the main form smaller, postcard size, but then there's all these extra schedules: Schedule One, Schedule Two, Schedule Three. So it's like it, it certainly didn't get um, more simple. In fact, it got more complex. But one of the things that they tried to do to make it more simple was to increase the standard deduction, right, which is just the essentially a flat amount that every person gets based on your filing status, and I have the dollar amounts here. And they started to limit people's itemized deductions so that in, in an effort to force more people into this, this standard deduction. Because I think when the IRS looks at the tax gap, right, and tax gap meaning the amount of tax that they believe they should collect versus what they actually collect, because again, we all self report our taxes. They always point to these you know, aggressive itemized deductions as a reason why they're not collecting tax. Um, and so they tried to make, make more people, force more people into this, this standard, deduction, um, standard deduction box. So I did want to just talk a little bit about some of the itemized deduction changes because, again, I think it's important just, again, to understand personally how things go. And we'll tie some things in, into real estate. So there used to be a, a limitation on the amount of itemized deductions that you could take based on your taxable income. So historically, the strategy was understand where that 
where that number is, what level, how much income can we make before we start to lose deductions and try to manage and stay below that number, that, that limitation is, is no longer here. And, and again, this is a temporary change. So from 18 to 2025, 20, you don't have to worry about your itemized deductions being limited solely because of your taxable income. What they did do, um, I'm gonna skip medical expenses. What they did do, and the big thing, and I think what's, what's pretty impactful to folks in the real estate community at large was, they limited the amount of state and local income, real estate, sales taxes that you can deduct on your tax return to $10,000. Now fortunately, we live in the great state of Pennsylvania where our personal income tax rate is 3.07%, which isn't too bad. Uh, however, our real estate taxes are terrible. So a lot of times it doesn't take a whole lot to get up to $10,000 when you aggregate your real estate taxes and your state and local income taxes. Uh, and so a lot of people found themselves being limited to $10,000 of state and local taxes on their return. Again, when you, when you, when you file your, your personal returns, you're either gonna take that standard deduction, that flat dollar amount, or you're gonna itemize everything. So this was a big thing that, again, limited people um, on, when they filed their tax return to being able to deduct their state and local taxes. There are, however, still some fully deductible taxes that I think it's important for people to remember, because again, I think this was kind of a misconception when people heard, hey, taxes are going to be limited. The first is real estate taxes paid on a rental property in, con in conjunction with a trader business. So if you have a rental property and you pay real estate taxes, there's no limitation there. We're only talking about taxes that you deduct or would have historically deducted on Schedule A as an itemized deduction. Any type of personal property tax paid with a trader business are also fully deductible against business income. Um, another opportunity, uh, which we sometimes see get missed is this whole concept of a home office deduction. And I hear this all the time. Every time I talk to people, it's like, oh, if I take the home office deduction, somebody told me some, at some presentation I went to that it's a red flag for audit. I'm going to get audited if I take the home office deduction. You're not going to get audited if you take the home office deduction, right? If you're, if you're, if you're greedy, right, and you say, hey, 50% of my house is my home office, that, that's probably a little aggressive. Yeah, it's going to be hard to defend. But I had, I'll just tell you a quick story. I had a client once that was an attorney in Harrisburg, and her husband was uh, a builder, and they had a really, really nice house, and they had a home office, and I think it was like, you know, 10.2% or something like that. And they were unfortunately getting audited by the IRS, and it was a field exam, right? So the IRS comes out, you know, and anytime I have a client get audited, I always make the IRS come to my office just to kind of manage the, the process. So she was at my office, and she wanted to inspect this home office, right? Because we were taking the deduction. She's like, I need to see this. And we had, you know, kind of all the expenses outlined, like here's the utility bills that we deducted and blah, blah, blah. And, and we were even like saying, well, again, I was an attorney, so we had, of course, the office, and then there was like a little library for books and things, and there was a bathroom, a separate bathroom. So we were kind of including all that in our home office. And this lady, you know, she was kind of like, I was in York, the client was in Harrisburg, and, you know, the thing you gotta understand about the IRS is, they, they start their day at 8 o'clock and they end their day at 4 o'clock every day. And that includes like travel, right? So they, gotta, they, they leave their house at 8, they got to get there. So it's usually like 9, 9.30 till they show up and going to get set up. And then, you know, it just, it's, they can take a lunch, an hour lunch, on, you know, on the dot. So it's like, you know, it's not like they're like grinding it out really hard, right? I mean, they're, they're trying to do their job as best they can. And hopefully there's no IRS agents in here. I don't want to offend anybody. But so anyway, she had something to do that day. So I'm like, yeah, you can, you know, the lady's there, she's ready, she's waiting for you, just go knock on the door. And I, I prep the client, I'm like, just don't, just let her in, just show her around, don't say anything, don't talk too much, just, you know, whatever. So, and I could tell, like, this, the girl that was doing the audit, she was in, like, in a hurry. So she drives up to Harrisburg, I kid you not, knocks on the door, puts her card in, in the, in the, like, in, like, the window area, like, in the storm door, and just leaves, and calls me on the, on the road home, and I was like, yeah, I drove to your client's house, I knocked on the door, she didn't answer, and the lady was there, like, she was ready to answer. She didn't answer, so, you know, I just left, but I looked at the house, you know, it looked, it looked like it could, it could have an office like that, so we're, we're good, there's no, there's no adjustment. <laughs> so that was my only, that was my only experience, and I've had a number of clients get audited over the years, that was my only experience with ever somebody challenging the home office deduction and actually having it, and so, I, I'm still I'm still taking these deductions on people's returns, and I and I you know sleep well at night, even in spite of that. So I would say if you have a home office, right? If you're legitimately working out of your home and you're not taking advantage of it, you should. And here's why: when you talk about taxes being limited, you can deduct a portion of your real estate taxes if you have a home office on like a Schedule C against 
your business income. If you do that, that piece that you're deducting there isn't limited, okay? And so you think about the person that's already kind of hit the $10,000 mark, they're losing some taxes, here's the way to get a couple extra bucks, uh, again, if you're filing a, a Schedule C um, as a sole proprietor. I've had some clients that have actually had an office and they, like let's say they have a separate entity that they're running their business out of, sometimes they would rent, rent from themselves to be able to kind of take advantage of some depreciation deductions, you know, take advantage of deducting some real estate taxes. And so there's just things that we look at to say, okay, like how can we maximize our ability to deduct not only our real estate taxes, but a portion of our utilities, take some depreciation on our house, blah, 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 you know, just, just to get some ad ad advantages there. And so again, I think, I think the home office deduction is a, is a good thing. And like I said, I think if you're, if you're legitimately working out of your house, it's something you should take. Uh, if you're risk adverse and you say, you know, yeah, I hear what you say, Kevin, but I just don't want to get audited, you know, because that, that would be awful. Um, there is a simplified method for the home office deduction. It's very, very simple. You just say, how, mu how much square footage is my office? What's the total square footage of my house? And you basically take, I think it's like five bucks a square foot up to like 1,500 bucks, I think. Again, I could, I could be wrong there, but it's close enough, right? So you don't even have to worry about like anything other than just measuring the square footage. So if you can work a tape measure, you know, you can take the deduction and it's, and it's easy. So I think just not taking it is just, and, to, and saying I'm not taking it because I'm worried about getting audited is just, it's just a, a bad excuse. I, I would, I Pretty would do it. Love home office. Yeah, it's about half. Maybe less than half. Yeah. And again, I, I hear it all the time. I, I'm going to get audited if I do it. So what, it's just. What makes the home office home office? I heard you have to have a door. No, it ha it's, so it's, it's supposed to be an area of your home that's used exclusively for business. So, and again, exclusively is kind of a loose term. But I would say that, you know, if you have a spot that's kind of segregated separate for the home office, you should be taking advantage of that. And keep in mind, when, you're, when we talk about, like, using a percentage of cost for that, I'm not talking about like every cost. So a lot of times like people have internet, right? All right, well you need internet to be able to do your job. Like I don't know how you can be in real estate and not have the internet. So we'll say, okay, well, we should be deducted more than like the square footage of the office because that really has no meaningful relationship to how much we use that internet for, for business. So I would, I sometimes tell clients, well, you need it. so. You want to be aggressive, we'll just duck 100% because it's like, how, how do we do our job without it? And if you're conservative and you say, well, I, yeah, there's some personal use, maybe we'll do 80% business, 20% non-deductible, but you should be taking internet, you know, phone lines, if you have a phone, fax, whatever, like all that stuff, you should be kind of bundling in there. Uh, like I said, we take depreciation, things like that. So I think if you have a spot that's kind of designated where you have a computer, you sit there, you do work out of, uh, it's something you should at least be talking to your advisor about, um, you know, to make sure that you're not missing something. Any other questions on that? You can't have a home office and an outside office, right? If you have an outside office, then that's... Uh... Yeah, I've heard people say that. So I, I, I think it depends, right? So I think the, the biggest thing is you can't say... You have, to, you have to designate where your main work location is, right? So if, you're, if you have a... Just because you have an office space somewhere, I don't think that, in my opinion, precludes you from having a home office deduction. <clears throat> if you say, hey, my home, my home office is my main office. That's where I do most of my work. But you know, when I have to meet with a customer or I have to do a settlement or whatever and I have to go into like a physical office, I use that, um, you know, that, that's okay. So as long as um, your home office is your primary. Yeah, that's, that, you have to kind of designate that. That's my, that's my main office. That's where I do my work out of. And so I have people that do that. Like I said, it's, it's big in like real estate, like realtors and things like that. Like they're, you know, they have, a lot of times they have a place that they kind of hub around, but they're, they're working mainly out of their home offices. So yeah, I don't think that's, that precludes you from, from having. Hey, <clears throat> Kevin, I had heard one time it has to do with the distance, maybe not, it's not, you know, the end of all means here, but like my office is five minutes from my house. So we don't do a personal deduction for our office in the house because, you know, the IRS audit says they're going to go, wait a minute, you've got an office five minutes away, you can't, have, you know. Yeah, again, I think it goes back to kind of just taking like a reasonableness approach. And I think it goes back to, to usage as well. If you spend most of your time in your business office, which we then do. you probably yeah, which you do, you probably don't. It probably wouldn't be appropriate to say, well, this is my this is my main my main office. You, you kind of pick one, and that's what you use. 
Well, again, I think if you if you're working out of an, like another office, and that's your primary, then that's what then that's what you you, you designate, and you're probably not going to be able to take as much advantage of the home office deduction. But if you say, hey, my home office is my main office, and I also work out of this location from time to time, I think that's okay. Um, I think another thing that was kind of somewhat impactful to the, the real estate community at large was the, some of the change that they made around mortgage interest. Um, because again, like people, people buy homes um, because, in, in, some, in some cases, because they perceive that one, it's an investment, and two, because they get some tax benefits from that. And so anytime you take away people's tax benefits, you're gonna have less people kind of saying, hey, like the kind of the cost of, of home ownership, it, it, you know, isn't as, isn't as affordable. And so that, that may be a good thing for some people that you know, have rentals because you're pushing more people into, into rentals, but if you're, you're buying and selling houses, this, this could be something that's um, a negative for you. So there was a couple changes that they made. The, the first was you used to be able to deduct up to a million dollars of acquisition, um, of interest on acquisition indebtedness. Acquisition indebtedness is debt that you incur to acquire a, a, a personal residence, right? So typically when you go out buy a house, it's your first mortgage. Um, in addition to that, you could also deduct $100,000, up to $100,000 of home equity debt. And it really didn't matter what you use that home equity loan for as long as it was secured by your personal residence and as long as your debt, there, you had to go, go through a calculation of debt relative to fair market value, but for simplicity, we'll just say 100000 As long as it was 100000 or less, you could deduct all the interest. Well, they made some changes, and again, I think there was some misconception. The first was that mortgage interest, you lose the deduction. That's not true. All they did was they changed that million-dollar number from you know million down to 750. And oh, by the way, it's only for acquisition indebtedness incurred after December 15, 2017. Yeah, anything before that date was still grandfathered under the old rule. So if you bought a million-dollar home prior to that, you're still able to fully deduct your interest, no problem. It's just for personal residence, right? Yeah, not for investments. Yeah, there's no there's no limitation on interest for investments. Good point, Greg. Um, so that's what I have here on this this slide. It's again, it's really acquisition debt that's used to acquire your personal residence. It doesn't apply to rental properties. It doesn't apply to property using the trade or business investment properties. It's really just you know personal interest. Um, the other change that was made, again, a lot of people said, hey, we can't deduct home equity interest anymore, home equity loans, because that was something that was kind of talked about. That's not entirely true anymore. Um, it's, it's a little bit more strict about what you can and can't deduct. Um, you can only deduct home equity interest to the extent that that loan was used to, again, make some type of substantial improvement or to acquire your, your principal residence. So um, if, you, if you use it to buy a car or put your kids in, through college or whatever, that, that it may not be deductible then, but if you used it for like putting a pool in at your house or something, that it would still be deductible. But the problem is, and you run, we run into this all the time, and you know, there's probably a lot of folks here that kind of you know, do, do things themselves and kind of use TurboTax. The banks, they, don't, they, don't, they just issue you a tax form, right? And it's gonna be a 1098, and it's gonna say, hey, here's your interest, and you plug it in there, it's gonna take the deduction, because it doesn't know, you know what I mean, like what's deductible and what's not. So you really have to be somewhat aware of what the rules are. The forms you get from the bank are all gonna look the same. They're all gonna say 1098, it's all gonna say mortgage interest, and you have to know what that was for. So sometimes where we see this come into play is refinancing, right? So, hey, my house went up in value, I had a mortgage of 500,000 on it, it went up in value, so I refinanced it, and you know, I pulled some equity out, all right? Let's say that I took out a, a mortgage for 750, all right? The first 500,000 that you take out on that refinance is still acquisition debt because all you're doing is refinancing that debt that you had originally had that you used to acquire your house. The 250, that additional amount that you refinanced above and beyond that debt, that's either gonna be home equity interest if you used it to, again, potentially like make an improvement to your home. It could be personal interest, non-deductible, if you, know, you, you went to, to Vegas and you know, spent it and on you know, good, good times. Or it could be like if you use it for some other purpose like buying a piece of real estate, it could be acquisition interest, investment interest expense, and it could be deductible, deductible somewhere else in your return. But when you get the tax form, it's all gonna look the same. It's all just gonna say mortgage interest. And so you really have to, you have to trace your interest. And there's, there's, interest tracing has been in the Internal Revenue Code for a long, long time. It's not a new concept, but people just don't 
haven't historically paid as much attention to it. But now with you know, the IRS kind of tightening things a little bit around interest, um, it's important to really trace that debt. What did I use that money for? Where can I deduct it, if at all, on my tax return? And so a lot of times when we're working with clients, we kind of have that conversation with them. When we see changes in their debt structure, say, okay, well, what was this for? How can we make sure we're maximizing and getting some type of tax benefit, tax deduction for it? Again, if you have a home office, you can deduct the mortgage interest, a portion of your mortgage interest from your home on that home office. I talked a little bit about that as well. Uh, I had some clients call me and say, hey, I heard charitable contributions aren't deductible anymore. That's, that's not true, just in case anybody thought that. Again, I think the, the, the misconception here was, hey, I'm taking the standard deduction. If you're taking the standard deduction, then none of these other things really matter for itemized deductions. But charitable contributions are still deductible, and in fact, they're even uh, more so than what they had been uh, in the past. So just above and beyond the standard deduction? No, you, you're either going to take one or the other. So you, you say, okay, I have 10,000 in real estate taxes, I have, you know, 5,000 of mortgage interest, and I have 15,000 charitable contributions. You add all those up, that's 30 grand. All right, my standard deduction is 24,000. I'm gonna take the 30, because that's higher. If the itemized end up being lower, you're just gonna take the 24 standard deduction. So it's one or the other. But what happened is, people that had like high taxes, they were used to itemizing. Now all of a sudden, it ratchets down to 10,000. Maybe their house is paid off, so they don't have any mortgage interest. And yeah, they give something to charity, but it's not enough to get them up over 24 grand. And so, like I said, a lot more people have kind of just been pushed into that itemized deduction. The other big thing that they changed was, and this was a, a, a big kicker for a lot of folks, is they got rid of those 2%, those miscellaneous itemized deductions subject to 2% of your adjusted gross income. So things like unreimbursed employee business expenses, things like investment advisory fees, um, unfortunately tax, tax preparation fees, um, you know, a lot of those things that you used to be able to deduct on Schedule A as a miscellaneous itemized deduction, they're, they're no longer there. Okay, you can't deduct any of them. So again, there, I, what I saw in, in this past year, just doing a lot of people's taxes, is there was a lot more people, or I'm sorry, a lot less people uh, itemizing, a lot more people taking uh, the standard deduction. Uh, and there's some planning that can be done around that. So some things that we did for clients that, you know, let's say you're charitably inclined and you usually give, you know, let's just say, I don't know, like $5,000 a year. Um, if you're right on the bubble there of being able to itemize and taking the standard, sometimes what we would, would do is we would try to like bunch deductions. So we'd say, okay, well, rather than giving five grand this year and five grand next year, why don't you just give 10 this year, you itemize this year, and then next year you don't give anything and you just take the standard deduction. And if you add the two years together, you're going to be better off than, you know, doing, doing it, um, you know, five grand, five grand. Um, another thing that we did for some clients is set up what's called donor advised funds. They're pretty cheap, but again, it's a way to make a big contribution into a fund, get a, get a pop for it, and then you can kind of spread the money out over years and kind of do whatever you want with it. So again, it's just some planning strategies around bunching deductions. It's not just applicable to charitable, charitable contributions, but that's usually something where you can kind of, you have a lot of control over the timing and when the payment is, is being made. Um, so again, if you're right in that bubble, I think it's something you should, you should look at with your advisor saying, hey, is there something I could be doing better to kind of get on the, on the long term? Kind of take, Kevin, take uh, stuff. if somebody has a half million dollar house, it's paid for, uh, could they just refinance? No, so if you refinance, uh, it goes back to our discussion about interest rates and you'd have to say, okay, well, what did I use the proceeds of that refinance for, right? To buy real estate. If you use it to buy real estate, then that would be acquisition interest, and you could deduct that interest on, against the property that you bought. So I could take 250000 and buy rental real estate, Yep. and I can deduct that interest then off my personal house. That's right. Bada beam, bada boom. But you have, again, it's, it's, it's about being intentional and really understanding it, because again, it, the worst thing you could do is stick that on a Schedule A and say it's an itemized deduction, because one, you would have gotten the standard deduction anyway, so you're giving up some stuff too. You know, the, the, that real estate deduction may be a lot more meaningful. It's not just gonna reduce your federal liability, it's also gonna reduce your state liability, by the way. Um, and so you're getting an extra 3% off the top there. So really just being smart and strategic about how you're tracing interest, it's a, it's a big thing, it's a simple thing to do, but if you're just purely looking at tax forms and saying, yep, you know, 1098, put it in here, I'll, yep, here's where it's supposed to go, you're not gonna get the right result. You may think you do, but you're not. Um, Credits, I just wanted to really quick talk about a couple key changes, the tax credits that happened. Uh, uh, the, the biggest one I, that I saw that this past year was the child tax credit. It's a really good time to have kids. So if you have kids or you're thinking about it, um, you know, you should probably do it. Selling a couple. 
You could save. <laughs> you could save. You could save two grand a pop, right? You get a two thousand dollar tax credit for kids. Uh, it used to be a thousand dollars, and it used to be. It used to phase out very, very quickly. So you couldn't make a. You couldn't make a lot of money and still get the child tax credit. Now, if you're married, filing joint, you can make up to four hundred thousand dollars and still get. You still get the full two thousand dollar child tax credit. Um, so again, I, I've seen a lot more people being able to take advantage of that that they hadn't been able to, uh, you know, before. Now, there's no more personal exemptions either. That was at like three thousand some odd dollars you used to get per dependent. So that kind of stinks. But keep in mind, tax credits are dollar for dollar reductions in tax, where deductions just reduce your income, and your benefit is really that reduction times your marginal tax rate. So credits are always always better. Um, you get them for kids up until age 17. Now again, I said it's a good time to have a kid. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. You know, it's still going to cost you a lot more than two grand a year to have kids. Um, <laughs> I know. I mean, and like I said, I have I have two myself. But I'm just saying that it's a good it's a good benefit. A lot of people got those credits that they hadn't hadn't historically. Um, they also kind of added this extra $500 credit. Those are for dependents that are still are still in your return. So you still have a dependent child, but they're not under age 17. Um, so like if you have a college student, um, I saw some people miss saying, well, hey, we don't get personal exemptions anymore, so I'm just gonna let my kids just claim themselves, you know, whatever, it's not, I don't get that. But it's like, dude, you could have got $500 for your kid if you would have just claimed them because they're in college and they're still technically a dependent. And so you really gotta look at that to say, is it better for my adult child, let's say, that's still, you know, in school, still living at home, is it better for them to claim themselves or should I be picking them up my return to at least, at a minimum, maybe get this $500 tax credit? So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, if they claim themselves, so they have to say that they're a dependent on, on your return. They do. Right. So if, if they, I mean, if kid has income, they have to file their own tax return. Correct. But when you file your return, you, you have to indicate whether you're a dependent of somebody else or you're, you're claiming yourself. And so a lot of times with, with college kids, it's, it's really just looking at how much income do they have, especially if they have like education credits that, they're available, that are available. Is it better for them to take them and get them? Is it better for you as the parent, you know, to take them? And it, honestly, it really doesn't matter who's paying for it. It doesn't matter. If they're your dependent. Right, <laughs> right. Well, that's usually how it works. But it, like if let's just say it was better for your kid to file their own return and claim themselves, it wouldn't matter that you're paying for it. They could just take the credit on their return. So it's really something you have to look at. And it's, there's not like a one-size-fits-all approach. It's really an a individual fact pattern. You've got you to run the numbers and see what makes the most sense. Child tax credit can be refundable as well. So if you don't have taxable income for some reason and you have kids, you still want to make sure you get advantage of, take advantage of it because you can actually get a, a, a refund check. Like there's credits that the IRS will actually pay you uh, in excess of what you paid in. Uh, and you have to have a valid social security number to be able to get, to get the credit. So, I mean, make sure you get a social security number for your kids if you're going to have them. Um, other notable items, uh, alternative minimum tax, AMT. That was a dirty word for a long, long time. It still is. Um, I saw a lot less people have issues with AMT this year. And I'll tell you why. Number one, the, two of the biggest add backs for alternative minimum tax for individuals was state and local income taxes, which now you're only allowed to deduct 10 grand, and those miscellaneous itemized deductions subject to 2%, which now you're not allowed to get any. So people that had big brokerage accounts that paid a lot of investment advisory fees and made good income, they were being sucked into AMT. So those, those deductions went away, so now a lot less people are being pulled into AMT. The other reason people aren't being hit with AMT is that they raised the exemption amount. So it used to be a really, really small exemption and, and again, it, AMT was supposed to be a, an alternative tax for the, for the wealthy and, and it just never kept up with inflation and increase in income. And so I, w I would say, you know, you, you could be a, you know, a, a middle class person, you know, not really feeling like, hey, I'm making a lot of money and, be, and being hit with this, this tax just because, again, it just, it just never got adjusted. So AMT is still around, but I think it's a lot less relevant for folks. Um, for, for individuals anyway. I put the exemption amounts in here, which again, aren't really overly meaningful. Um, another thing I think I'll point out just, just for, for folks that, again, I think, I feel like, you know, kind of looking around the room and, and talking with Harry, there's a lot of folks that are kind of self-employed uh, individuals. A lot of times what comes with that is trying to have to struggle with, how, you know, how do I get health insurance for myself, right? And so if you guys remember 
number of years ago, um, under you know, previous administration, there was the whole Affordable Care Act, some people refer to as Obamacare, right? That whole, you know, um, I, I would say that the, the concept of trying to get you know, health insurance for all and to penalize those folks that don't get health insurance, there was this shared, what they called a shared responsibility payment. It sounded better than a penalty, so that's what they called it, you know what I mean? Uh, but it was essentially a penalty that you paid additional tax if you didn't have health insurance or your health insurance that you had wasn't good enough. Um, that, that, you, that, you're no longer subject to that penalty anymore, okay? So starting this year, you don't have to pay that penalty anymore. So if you were kind of like looking, I know like this is the time of year where people start to think about like renewals and you know, going out and looking for stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying don't get health insurance. I'm just saying that if you find a plan that maybe wasn't ACA compliant and you're like, shit, I'm gonna have to pay that penalty again, you may not have to pay that penalty anymore because it doesn't apply anymore. Okay, so that, that's a big, I think it's a, it's a good change. Um, again, I, I personally believe that it's good for folks to have insurance, and I, I, I think it's a good concept to try to create a, a program where everybody can have it. Um, the problem was, that I saw with it was, you know, you didn't, you didn't have to make a lot of income before you were not like getting the benefits of that. Like, you know, they, they would have these credits that people could get, but it was all income dependent, and I saw so many people you know, fill out the applications and say, gosh, I'm not paying anything for my insurance. Then they go to file their tax return, because what happened is you got what was called an advanced credit. So they would say, hey, well, based on what you said, here's what your, your premium should be. And you file your tax return, it's like, well, what do you mean I owe this money? Oh, it's because you made more, and now you have to pay some of this credit back. And so it didn't quite work out the way I think that they had intended it to. If you didn't make anything, you were in the, you know, in the low, 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 you know, poverty, below the poverty line, you could get free health insurance without a doubt. But for a lot of working folks, I mean, you were paying still a, a ton of money for health insurance. And because everybody got on, on health insurance, the cost of premiums kept going up and up and up and up. So again, just keep in mind that that shared responsibility payment, AKA penalty uh, for not having health insurance no longer uh, is around. Kevin, can I uh, deduct my two German Shepherds? You cannot deduct your two German Shepherds. How about if they're protecting my real estate. No. From vandal. <laughs> nice try, Harry. What do you mean, no? <coughs> nice try, Harry. That's the same as cameras, right? No. Or, okay, they eat a lot more. <laughs> yeah. This kind of stuff I have to deal with all the time. Um, <laughs> another, another thing I think to keep in mind, and this is, I think, uh, particularly relevant to, to this group, is you know some of these, um, additional taxes that are still in effect. And the one is this 3.8% net investment income tax. So that was a tax that came into play around the same time that the Affordable Care Act came in. And this was the way that they were helping to pay for the cost of, of that bill. What they did was they said, okay, we're going to give people this health insurance, but we're gonna charge this extra tax on investment income. Well, what's investment income? It's interest, dividends, and income on passive activities, from passive activities, one of which is rental real estate. And so again, if you're, if you're in the real estate business, the one thing that you should be considering and, and talking to your advisor about is, do I participate in real estate enough that I can you know, justify being a real estate professional? Because if you're a real estate professional, what would generally be treated as passive income, rental real estate, can be treated as active, and you can avoid this 3.8% net investment income tax. Because it's- 3.8% it's in addition to everything. Right, yeah. And, and, and so it's not just 3.8, it's 3.8 plus 0.9? Well, that's a different tax. Okay. The 3.8% <laughs> is just the, this is the net investment income tax. And it only applies when you're in a certain income level. Right. But let's just say that you are a real estate. It's like 250, yeah. It? Let's say you're in the real, you're a real estate professional. Let's say you sell a property and you have a big capital gain event. That capital gain would be subject to, to the 3.8 plus. So right, right. So you could be looking at. 23.8 if you're in the top bracket instead of just 20%. Right. And so if you're a real estate professional though, and you dispose of an activity in which you materially participate, you avoid that 3.8% even on long-term capital gains as well. So again, I think understanding kind of what your status is, right. there's certain elections that you wanna make with your tax returns. So a lot of times I'll make these elections with people's returns every year, just as like a protective election to say, hey, I'm a real estate professional. Uh, there's aggregation rules because um, let's say I have 10 real estate properties, 10 rental properties. Um, 
you know, there's certain hours requirements that you would have to meet. And if you look at each activity individually, it's hard to meet it for each one. And so what the IRS rules allow you to do is file, make an aggregation election and say, I'm going to treat all these as one activity for purposes of, you know, material participation. And as long as you meet them in total, you're deemed to meet them for every single activity. So you don't have to look at each one individually. And so kind of making sure you're making the elections on your return, saying, hey, I want to aggregate all these activities, uh, treat them as one. You only have to do it technically once, and that's good forever, but I, I just file it every year just as like, you know, because how are you going to prove that, you know, in 1987 when you, filed, you first got into the business, you made that election? I mean, the IRS doesn't know that. And, you know, in case you didn't know, the burden of proof is always on the taxpayer when it comes to IRS matters. And so I just, I just make it, and I put a footnote with everybody's return saying this is just a protective election. We've had it in place for years, but we're just reaffirming that this is what we want to do. Um, and so, again, 3.8% can be a lot of money. Can you yeah. avoid that if you incorporate all your properties under the corporation? No. Well, if you're a C-Corp, maybe, because it's not going to flow through to your personal return. But if it's like an LLC, if it's a pass-through, you have to look at the activity and say, am I materially participating in the activity or not? Is it passive or am, is it active? And if it's passive, you're subject to this. It doesn't matter how, how, it's, how it is as long as it, if it's on your personal return, it's subject to this. What's that? Yeah. Yep. And there's a whole, there's a number, there's a number of tests. Like I said, if you just Google real estate professional, you'll see they have like a whole list of things that you need to be able to justify. But the 0.9%, that's a Medicare surtax. That's on high wage earners. That was just in this slide, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. What's high wage for the zero It's 250. Yeah. Um, and then there's, there's still the exclusion for the sale of a principal residence. That still is, is remains. So a lot of people know of that, especially if you're in real estate, take advantage of that. Hey, I'm going to move into a house. I've got to live there for two out of five years. And if it was my... Yeah, it's, it's two, I'm sorry, it's 250 per person. So if you're single, it's 250. If you're married, you can exclude up to 500,000. Yeah, thanks for... Not really. I mean, if you took a lot of depreciation, if you used a big percentage, it, it can maybe. Um, but... It's, yeah. Right. Right. And the reason they're asking that is because if you say, if you answer any of those questions wrong, they're going to issue you a 1099-S form, uh, which again, just because you get a tax form doesn't necessarily mean something's taxable. It's just you got to be cognizant because when, when you get that tax form, guess who also gets it? The IRS, right? They get a copy of it. And so a lot of times they're trying to match a form with somebody reporting something on, the, on a return. That's why, that's why those, those forms are in place. And so if I have a client that gets that form because they answered something wrong, and we got to make some type of reporting, do something on their return to make sure they don't get a notice because that's what they're going to that's what's going to happen. Hey, we got this form. We didn't see you reported anything. You know what's what's the deal? So just to confirm, just having a real estate license in addition to being an investor doesn't necessarily qualify as a professional or some other things that. Yeah, there's there's hours and things like that that you need to. Just do real. Yeah, just real. It's called real estate professional. I mean, if you have a license, that's a pretty good argument, I think. You know. Uh, it's a, it, again, it comes down to as, 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 as many things, a facts and circumstance based approach. So you want to be able to build, build an argument around like why you, you qualify. Um, you're not, there are some hard, some hard line rules, some kind of what they call like safe harbors. Anytime you see something in tax law that says safe harbor, that doesn't mean you have to do it. You have to meet those or you can't do it. It just means that, hey, if you meet these safe harbors, you're fine. Like the IRS isn't going to challenge you. If you, if you can't, for some reason, then it comes down to this facts and circumstance based approach where you have to be able to build some argument as to why you still meet the criteria in light of the fact that you weren't able to, to meet the safe harbor. Um, you know, I, I just put this up here. I left it in, in a slide. It was an old, an old slide from 2018, but I think it's meaningful. Like, the one thing people, when, when I go around and ask people, like, hey, how, you know, how'd you make out this year with taxes? Everybody's like, terrible. I, you know, I got less back this year than I've ever gotten back. And I think, and, and like it was like, again, like you, you watch, depending on what news channel you watch, like you hear different things, right? So like a lot of the politics around this was, you know, refunds are down by whatever percentage they were. And the reason refunds are down, just, I mean, it may, this may come to surprise to people, but the reason they're down is because less money was taken out of your paycheck, okay? If less, if you pay less in, chances are you may get less back, okay? It's just the way, the way it works. Even if tax rates are down, you pay less in, you're gonna get less back. And so what happened was, when, when this tax bill got passed, one of the things Trump wanted to do, again, comes back to politicking, he wanted people to get more money in their paycheck, right? He wanted people to see, like, hey, we passed this tax bill, and because of it, you're getting more money. So what they do, they came out with these new withholding tables, all right? People got more in their paychecks, they were feeling really great, and then they went and filed their tax, and they're like, 
I didn't get as much back. Like, what's, what's the deal here? So just because you got less back doesn't mean you paid more in tax. You may very well have paid less in tax. You just paid less in as well, and you paid, um, you paid enough less in that your refund got affected by it. So the, the takeaway with the slide, the reason I left it in there was if, you have, if you're a worker, you get a W-2, you're a wage earner, and you weren't happy with your refund last year, and you kind of use that as a savings mechanism, like the, the way to fix that is to, to fill out a new W-4, right? The, the IRS did come out with new W-4 forms. That's anytime you get a new job, typically that your employer gives that to you and says, hey, fill this out, and everybody's like, how the heck do I fill this out? I, don't, I mean, it's just confusing, but if you're currently not, if you haven't changed jobs, that doesn't preclude you from going and saying, hey, I want to fill out a new W-4 and have more withheld, so, but, <coughs> I'm not a big proponent of over withholding just to get a bigger refund. I think you're basically giving the government an interest free loan. But there's some people that that's the only way they can save money is to just have the government hold on to it and get it back, you know, every April. So anyway, I just, I just like I said, I, you, you read stuff, you hear stuff like people, I would say people in large part paid less tax. I think people in real estate, people, business owners paid less tax for sure. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate to bigger refunds because some of these changes that were made. And that's a great <clears throat> negotiating tactic for realtors who are sitting at the table and there, there might be a $30, $40, $50 difference a month and they just don't want to go over 1200 bucks and it's 1245 I used to always ask them, how many deductions are you claiming? Four? Why don't you just claim two? That's going to give you more money in your paycheck each week so you can make that little additional payment and you won't even feel it. It works. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so let's well, I want to just talk a little bit about some some business tax changes, reform things, planning ideas. Because uh, again, like a lot of, a lot of us here are business owners, and so a lot of these things I think would be will be meaningful for you. Again, this is, you don't need to read that. That's just a slide with some some key deadlines here for 2019 filing season. Uh, I want to start out by talking about some accounting methods. Um, it, it depends on what you do. This may or may not be a, a very meaningful discussion uh, you know, for this group. Uh, but you know, when, you, when you file a, a business return, uh, one of the decisions that you have to make when you first file a return is what accounting method that you want to use for tax purposes. And there's really two main accounting methods. The first is the, the cash method, cash receipts, cash disbursements, which is pretty a simplistic method. If I collect cash, it's taxable income. If I spend money, it's a tax deduction. Cash in, cash out, income <coughs> deductions. The other method is the accrual method, um, which is, is more based on like billings and you have to worry about receivables and payables and accruals and all that stuff. Um, one of the things I think that was a positive change, um, and it, it did in some respects make things uh, more simple, uh, was, you know, the people, only people that could use the cash method were what the IRS deemed to be small taxpayers, okay? And one of the changes that they made as, as part of this reform was they, they kind of changed the definition of what is, is small from where it used to be, and it used to depend on you know, how you were organized, were you a regular C corporation, was inventory a material income producing factor in your business? Um, they changed all those rules and basically said, hey, if, if your gross receipts, your average annual gross receipts for the last three years were 25 million, 25 million or less, you can use the cash method if you want. We don't care. And so I had a lot of clients that were really, really nice sized businesses that were using the accrual method because they had to under old law that we switched to the cash method because the one nice thing about the cash method is it gives you maximum flexibility, right? You want to get deductions, you spend money, all right? You want to defer income? You, you delay billings, right? I'm not saying you, you take those checks and put them in the drawer and wait till January deposit. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you, you, uh, you delay billings, right? And then you, that, way you don't, that you don't get paid till, till January. And so I think an accounting method um, can be a very, very powerful tool. And if, and if, oh, by the way, when you started your business 20 years ago, you selected a method and it's not what you want anymore, you can change your method. You have to file an application with the IRS and say, hey, I was doing it this way, now I want to do it that way. And if there was a, like a cumulative benefit that you would have gotten, had you been on that, this new method, you can take a one-time deduction for it. So I had a lot of clients get some really, really nice deductions here in 2018, simply by just switching their accounting method from accrual um, to cash. Um, a reason I wanted to bring it up with this group, I don't know how many people here are contractors, but 
the tax code has a lot of special accounting methods for contractors. Um, and the, the one thing that you used to have to do if you were somebody that had like long term, longer term contracts, you had to use what was called the percentage of completion method. Um, you no longer have to use that if you're under 25 million. You can use what's called the completed contract method, which essentially means that you don't recognize any income from that, that long term contract until you actually finish the, the job. Um, a lot of residential contractors were already used to that because if you're a home construction contractor, you could, could use that regardless of size. But I think where it, where it became more meaningful is, is kind of some of the specialty trade contractors and things like that that had done some more longer term um, type work. The other reason I think that this is an important distinction for what's small and what's large kind of goes back to some of the interest limitation rules. So, you know, the, the one I would say negative change that affected the real estate industry um, was some of the limitations that they put on the deductibility of interest. And there was a lot of talk around that that said, hey, if you don't have income, you may not be able to deduct your interest, right? So they came out with this new, what they call business interest limitation under 163J that essentially said if you, if, you're, if your interest exceeds 30% of your taxable income, we're gonna limit your deduction to that amount. And so a lot of real estate people were concerned because one, um, a lot of times you'll, you'll you know, borrow money to, to invest in a real estate project, right? Number two, um, when, you get a, when you're trying to get a, something off the ground, usually the first couple of years you lose money because of depreciation and things like that. You know, you're still trying to get, you know, get, get the, the space fully occupied. And so you know, because the real estate in industry tends to use debt you know, you know, pretty, you know, it's, 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 a, it's used widely, that there was a big concern about people being able to use, the, be able to still deduct their interest. Um, the one piece that people missed in this whole thing was that if your average annual gross receipts from all your activities were less than 25 million, it, it didn't even apply to you. So I had a lot of smaller clients that it didn't even really matter. You know what I mean? Like it was really only really big clients that really saw this as being, you know, potentially problematic for them. And then again, there's other ways that you can kind of get around it. The one, the one thing that they did allow for the real estate industry because of the potentially crippling effect that it could have to not to lose interest deduction was you can elect out of this limitation altogether. There's some strings attached, but um, there's, there's options there. So I, I would say, I, I still think, again, if you're you know, under 25 million, you know, interest is still a good, a good tactic for, for real estate projects to be able to borrow money and, and deduct interest. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about just some of the depreciation incentives. Um, so, for, you know, from September of 17 all the way through you know, December 31st of 2022, if you buy anything that has a class life of 20 years or less, you can write off 100% of it. So what are some of those things? Furnitures and fixtures, right? Um, carpeting, things like um, land improvements. Land improvements are a 15 year asset. So you have a property you need to put a, a parking lot on, you can, you can deduct 100% of it. In one year? In one year. So these are the bonus depreciation rules, okay? And they used to be, bonus appreciation has been around since September 11, 2001. That's when it came in and it was 30%, then it went to 50%, then it went away for a little bit, then it came back. It's now 100% bonus depreciation. So anything that's less than, again, 20 year life, you can take 100% bonus depreciation. So things that don't count would be residential and non-residential real property. The, the building itself, it's either gonna be 27 and a half or 39 years, that's not gonna qualify for bonus. But a lot of other things, uh, do qualify for bonus. There's also this section 179 deduction, which has been around for a long time. That's that asset expensing election, which is a lot like bonus, but there's some things that can qualify for section 179 that don't necessarily qualify for bonus. Things like uh, a new roof. Since a, a roof is exterior, it's part of the building, it'd be normally a 27 and a half year asset, wouldn't qualify for bonus, but you can take section 179 on the roof. New HVAC, um, fire, you know, alarm systems, any, any type of alarm system that would normally be a longer life, you can take 179. And 179 used to not be available to rental real estate, but with, again, with some of these changes now, you're able to take advantage of 179. So I think just in general, kind of depreciation planning is a, is a big thing for a lot of real estate professionals because of, again, being able to maximize the deduction that you get in any given year could have a you know significant impact on the tax that you pay, especially if you're going to have a um, you know a big gain event or something like that in a year. Um, 
Yes. You bought something in 2018. Yep. And failed to take advantage of that. Yes. In 2018 tax year. Can you still take advantage of it? Yes. The following year? So the question is, let's say I bought something in 18 and I didn't take advantage of it, and now I realize that I could have. Is all hope lost? The answer is no. Again, you can file a, an application for change in accounting method with the IRS. You can say, hey, I was depreciating this asset like this. I wanted to, I wanted to depreciate it now like, like that. And if you, if you file that application, what you can do is you can deduct to 2019 the difference between what you would have gotten and what you actually took. So you actually can kind of take a catch-up adjustment. Um, you have to file the application. The nice thing is it's an automatic accounting method change, which means there's no user fee. You basically file the application, and the IRS is is deemed to have accepted that unless they come back and say, hey, we don't accept it. But for like a depreciation change, that's, I mean, that's a no-brainer. And to follow up on that, if I buy a house and it already has air conditioning and it has heat and yeah. it has carpet and yeah. all that stuff's already included in that purchase price, Yeah. do I need to have someone like a professional come in and tell me that that AC is worth $3,800? Yeah, you're st stealing a little bit of my thunder here, but yes. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> so, the one thing I had on here was about this, this whole concept of cost segregation study, which I think what, what Greg's trying to get out here is you don't necessarily, so the answer is you don't necessarily need a professional, but let's say you buy a property, right, and as Greg mentioned, there's components of that property, like a lot of times what I see when, when I work with clients all the time is, right, you, you buy something and they're going to have typically two assets on their depreciation schedule. Those two assets are going to be land and building, right? Land's not depreciable, building's either 27 and a half or 39. But the reality is we know when we buy a property, there's cabinets in there, right, when we bought it, and clearly we paid something for those that were there. Uh, there's carpet that was there. Um, there was, you know, if it's a big, like, you know, residential complex, there's probably a parking lot, you know, so there's going to be some land improvements. And so what a cost segregation study is, it's, it's the process of kind of identifying those components of a greater property, like a bigger property, and segregating those costs into separate buckets so that you can take advantage of some of the accelerated depreciation that's available, um, you know, on those on those items. The one big change with bonus that made cost segregation even more meaningful was um, you could take bonus on new and used property. Bef when it first came out, it was only new stuff, original use assets. So now, even if you buy a used property, you can still take bonus on something. And and so I, again, I think if you're not doing a cost tag and you need deductions, it's something you can certainly look at, even if you missed the boat like in 2018, and you say, hey, I'm sitting here in 2019, I got all this income, I need, I need a, you know, kind of an ace in the hole here to, to get some deductions. Cost seg might be a good, a good option for you. Um, if you do it when you first acquire the property, you don't have to do anything special. If you do it after the fact, then you have to file that accounting method change like I talked about. But I, I've done a lot of these for clients. Um, you know, it, like I said, it depends on the dollar amount. Um, what I would say, Greg, is it depends on the dollar amount that you're trying to take, which would dictate whether you want to like go get a full-blown study done and have that report, kind of that um, you know audit proof. Hey, here you go, agent, when they come in. Or if it's smaller dollars, again, as long as you're being reasonable and you have some methodology for how you're carving carving stuff up, I think you know you can you can certainly take advantage of this and kind of do it uh, on your own. Yes. But what I ended up doing was if my income continued to be staying the same or growing, I ended up in five or seven years actually paying substantially more in taxes, assuming I didn't get any more appreciation or something from it. Yeah. So I, when I sell these projects to clients, I always tell them, like, a cost segregation study doesn't get you something that you wouldn't otherwise already get, right? If you pay $100,000 for, for a property, and let's say that, that whole $100,000 is appreciable, you're going to be able to write that $100,000 off over some period of years. The question is, do you want to write it off over 40 years, or do you want to write it off, you know, 50% of it off now, and the other 50% over four years? And so the analysis, cost-benefit analysis, really comes down to a time value of money. If I can save, you know, 20 grand in taxes today, what would that, what would that mean versus saving it, um, you know, just spreading it out over time? Now, if tax rates are going up, if people think tax rates are going up, maybe, that, maybe it's not as, as beneficial, but, you know, you got to look at, okay, well, if I save 20 grand in taxes, what do, what do I do with it? Do I pay down debt? Do I do this? And you, there's going to be some meaningful impact that you get by, by being able to save taxes. So um, 
again, I, and I think it goes back, it's like there's no one size fits all approach either. Like, again, if you're, if you're in a situation where I sold a property and I have this big capital gain and I wanna be able to do something to, to offset that, that'd be a great, a great time to do a cost segregation study. Um, if you're not, you don't have a lot of income and you buy a property and you're like, I really don't need the deductions, then don't, then don't do it. Um, if you do accelerate that depreciation, then let's say you got to sell it the next year for some reason, you got to recapture that's right. that's all right. that. Yeah, if you sell it again, that's that's the other piece of it as well, is that that depreciation is subject to, you know, tax when if and when you sell the property. Potentially, it depends what you're selling. So, again, long-term capital gains is only on like real property. It's like if you sell, like if I sell a, a car that's personal property, then you recapture that at ordinary income rates, it's not long-term capital gains. I always argue when I do cost segs, well, the appreciation and value is not because of the kitchen cabinets or the carpeting or the land improvements, it's the building, so it's all, that stuff wasn't worth anything, is, you know, you kinda you gotta play both ends there, you know, so I, I try, to, try to make the argument that it's all long-term capital gains anyway, but it, it may not be. Um, I would so, think that would come more into play if somebody's buying a machine shop where yeah. there's really expensive, or a printing press company where there's really expensive machinery in there that's coming with the property. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and the other thing I would say too when it comes to depreciation, and um, I find still that people tend to overcapitalize. And what I mean by that is, I think it's like probably back in like 2014 maybe, there was some, some regulations that came out that, that were called the tangible asset regulations. And it really stemmed from the airline industry where you think of those airplanes, right? Like every so many years, they had to like replace, you have to replace the engines on an airplane and you think about how much money it costs to replace an, uh, an engine, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the IRS was in litigation with um, a big airline company because they're like, that's, that's a capital expenditure. And the IRS position was, well, it's got a useful life greater than a year. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the dollar amount that you're spending is significant, so you should capitalize it, right? Um, but what the airline industry said was, well, but it doesn't really change, change the, you know, or extend the estimated useful life of that airplane. It may, may do the engine, but that's just a small component of the, of the bigger airplane. It doesn't adapt the plane to a new and different use. And so they actually won a court case and, and were able to justify it as a repair and maintenance deduction. So after going to court a lot of times and losing, the IRS finally got, you know, tired of it and said, okay, we're gonna come out with like regulations on what you have to capitalize and, and they were called these tangible asset regulations. And the first thing that I always look, look at with clients is, you know, number one, do we even need to capitalize in the first place? So a good example is like parking lot resurfacing. That can be expensive, right? You can spend a lot of money resurfacing a parking lot. That's a repair, I hate to tell you it's a repair. It doesn't matter if it's 20 grand, it's a repair. Like you don't have to capitalize that. Um, even though it was 20 grand and even though, yeah, it's gonna extend the life of that parking lot, you look at, it, at the property as a whole and say, well, you know, again, it doesn't adapt the property to a new and different use. You're not adding something. Um, you know, you're just basically essentially resurfacing. So that's, that's fully deductible, and you don't even have to go through these depreciation rules. It doesn't matter because it's a repair. Um, replacing windows, right? The IRS had some, some um, examples in the regulations when they, when they came out with them saying, well, if you replace less than a third of the windows in a building, that's a repair. If you go more than a third, it's a capital expenditure. So there's all these little intricacies. Roof repairs, I see a lot of roof repairs. Um, Again, roofing can be expensive. If you essentially like reshingle a roof, that's a repair. If you strip a roof down to its substructure and then resheet it and do all, then, then that might be a capital expenditure. But like I just said, you could take 179 on it. And so it's really, the, the starting point when you're always looking at fixed assets is one, do I even need to capitalize it? If you don't, deduct it as a repair. If you do, then it's like, do I need to, then what depreciation method should I, should I look at? But I, I can't tell you how many times I look at people's returns and I see things that I know like, should, should have just been deducted in the first place that they're sitting there writing off over, you know, 30 years, which just, to me, it's un, unnecessary. I skipped this slide, I just wanted to, the, the one thing I just wanted to highlight with this, this slide here was, um, how long do I have, Harry? I don't wanna go too. Oh, you got uh, another seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Um, the, the one thing that, that was part of this new tax bill was this whole concept of qualified improvement property that was basically, um, a definitional error, or de definitional flaw in the tax rules. It was really uh, centered around interior improvements that you were able to get, like you're supposed to be able to get accelerated depreciation on. That, that, that you can't do that anymore. Uh, you, you don't get that benefit. Uh, so I put this little chart in here just to, to say like what's eligible for bonus, what's eligible for 179. Um, 
a couple things I wanted to just talk about here, like kind exchanges. Everybody in real estate, a lot of people in real estate have heard of like kind exchanges, 1031 exchanges. You, you're still able to do those uh, for real estate exchanges. You can't do 1031 exchanges for non-real estate assets. So you can't exchange an automobile for automobile and defer the gain anymore, airplane for airplane, whatever. Um, again, I think that's for personal property, it's a lot less meaningful because of being able to take 100% bonus depreciation. But again, just so I've had people come to me and say, hey, you can't do 1031 exchanges anymore. And that's, that's not true. You can still do it, but it's only for uh, real estate. Can you uh, back up a minute? Sure. Entertainment expenses. Oh, yeah, I did skip that. Entertainment expenses are no longer deductible. Meals are, you can still deduct 50% of your meals, but entertainment expenses are no longer deductible. So when Harry takes me out golfing, unfortunately, he can't deduct it as an entertainment expense because they're no well, longer deductible. Right. <laughs> well, if, what you do is you, you don't get the, re you get just the summary receipt and you write that it's a meal and not, yeah, that's right. No more meal. golf, we're heading right for the bar. <laughs> <laughs> In all our years working together, Harry's, Harry's never taken me golfing, just so we're, we're clear here. <laughs> That's a win-win yeah. situation for me. <laughs> I'm not sure he's ever taken me to the bar either. Golf. Let's just be honest with each other. But um, no, so I, again, like when you're, if you're, if you're entertaining clients, uh, which again, I think like in, in real estate, that, that happens a lot, be, be smart about it. So like the big, the big example they have in the rules are sporting events, right? So let's say you have a skybox at a sporting event. You take clients there to entertain them. That, that's no longer deductible at all, 0%. It's still a business expense. You just don't get a tax benefit wow. for it. But if you're buying food as part of that, you know, if you're having it catered, have them split out the food and, and deduct that separately. We had a lot of clients, and I think even like in QuickBooks and some of those programs, they always have like accounts that are called meals and entertainment. You don't want to do that. You want to have meals and you want to have entertainment so that you can you know, specifically identify the difference between the two so you can at least get the 50% benefit for uh, meals. Shooting sporting clay, Scott, still deductible. Uh, corporate tax rate, I just threw this in there, just a lot of people, there was a lot of buzz, and this was probably the most highly publicized change, was this re reduction in corporate tax rates. Keep in mind that only applies to like regular corporations, tax paying entities. Yeah, it's a flat 21% tax rate, but corporations are still subject to double tax, meaning the, co the corporation pays tax, and then if they distribute money to the owners, there's another level of tax. Um, so I, I haven't, like a lot of people thought we should, they should convert to corporations. I haven't seen hardly anybody do it. It just doesn't make sense because the Pennsylvania corporate tax rate is 10%. So when you look at 10 versus three, it just, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, this is a big one, and, I, and I'm sad that I only have like three minutes now to, to talk about it, but it's, it's very, very give important. Me five. You give me yeah. five. This is that, um, yeah, this is the qualified business income deduction, what we call the QBI deduction. A um, couple things I wanted to make sure that I mentioned to this, this group. Number one, Real estate activities qualify for this deduction. It's essentially a 20% haircut off your, off your taxes. You get a 20% deduction for anything that's a qualified trader business. And really, the, how they define a qualified trader business in the, in the code with this is just basically by what it's not. So everything's qualified unless you, you fit into some of these other, what they call like specified service trader businesses. Um, so real estate activities do very much qualify. Uh, you get a 20% deduction. It's, it's a biggie. Um, the deduction is limited, though, to the lesser of that 20% or 50% of W-2 wages or, in the case of real estate, what a lot of people do is it's 25% of W-2 wages and there's a percentage of your, uh, what they call, um, your, your qualified business assets. Um, and so it's 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of business property. So unadjusted basis means before depreciation. And there's this whole convoluted calculation you have to go to what counts, what doesn't. The, the quick, quick and dirty rule of thumb is that if you're still depreciating it, you can still, it still counts. The unadjusted basis still counts. Um, and so again, I think it's, this is really important to make sure you, you quantify. Some of these limitations that people are worried about, if, you, if your taxable income is less than $315,000, these things don't even matter, okay? So I had a lot of clients that were really worried about not being able to take advantage of the deduction, but at the end of the day, kept their taxable income below three fifteen. dollars Again, it goes back to planning. When, wh why would I want to try to manage my income? Not because I'm worried about what tax bracket I'm in, but because, hey, if I keep it under 315, I don't, have to, I don't really care about anything other than just I get a 20% haircut. So that, that's a really, really big thing. The other the, the thing that I want to make sure I mentioned to this group was um, the one question that we had, because it is a trader business deduction, the one question that we had going into this that was really unclear in the tax law was, does rental real estate 
rise to the level of a trader business. In other, in other words, let's say I have a rental property. I'm a CPA, that's my main job, but I have a rental property because I, you know, I, I, I see the value there and I want to have some, some extra you know, passive income or whatever. Is that, does that rise to the level of trader business that allows me to take this deduction, right? And so what the IRS did, like, as they always do, like you know, in, in the 12th hour, like at, after we're already into tax season pumping out returns, is they came out with a safe harbor. And they said, in order for rental real estate activities to rise to the level, again, it's a safe harbor, so it doesn't mean if you don't hit this that it's, it's done, it's just you have to make some type of facts and circumstance argument. In order for rental real estate to, to rise the level of trader business under the safe harbor, you have to do a couple things. Number one, you have to maintain separate books and records for your real estate enterprise, okay? I don't know how you do your tax without maintaining separate books and records, but if you're not, keep separate books and records, okay? Secondly, you have to spend at least 250 hours of a year on rental services that are provided by the owner, agent, or contractor. So you don't necessarily need to do it, you just have to be at a document that, hey, we're spending 250 hours on this property and it's somebody that, you know, it's an agent of mine, it's a contractor of mine, or I'm spending it myself. And the big, the big one is that you have to keep contemporaneous records, including time reports, logs, or similar documents to show the hours worked. Description of the service, the date, who performed the service. Now, I, I recognize that probably nobody's going to do this, but the reality is when you file your tax return last year, when you filed it, if you wanted to take it, you probably filled out an election statement with your return saying, I'm, I'm electing the safe harbor so that I can take the 20% the deduction on my rental real estate activities. Um, what they allowed you to do, because they came out with this so late, they said, bullet one and bullet two still apply, but we're not going to make you keep contemporaneous records because we didn't tell you that you had to keep contemporaneous records, so it wouldn't be fair to say, oh, hey, by the way, if you didn't have these records, you don't get the, the benefit. But 2019, you have to have those records. And so what I would s suggest doing is, you know, again, one, make sure you keep separate books and records. Two, you know, document the time that you're spending and try to keep some type of contemporaneous log. The worst thing you can do when you get an audit is have nothing, right? So you go there and say, hey, you know, I didn't, I didn't keep a log, sorry. They're going to say, okay, well, you don't, get the, you don't get it. If you keep a log for a month and say, well, here's what I spent. This is a typical month. Here's what I spent, like, this month. It was like 50 hours, so I just kind of said, well, if I spent 50 hours this month and you take it times 12, I'm, I'm way over, so I felt like I was okay at it, you know, didn't keep it. You have to have something. Right? You have to give the IRS something. If you have nothing, you're going to lose every, every time. The reality is, in most cases, there, that's, a, that's another human being sitting on the other side of the table. Like, they are reasonable people, but, at, like, when you, when you go, like, unprepared and, and, I'm, and I'm just kind of just turn, turn a blind eye to the rules, you're, you're going you're gonna to lose every time. So I think, like... When you make that election this year with your return to make sure that you're getting that 20% deduction for your rental real estate, um, you know, you, you got to make sure you have this stuff because you're basically signing an election saying, I certify that, I, that I'm doing this, this thing. Um, the big red flags in, in rental real estate is if it's like, like triple net leases. So if you have a, a, a rental and you basically have rental income and depreciation expense and that's it, that's not going to rise to the level of, of a, a trader business. Unless, the only, the only caveat to that is if it's a self-rental, so if you're running it to yourself, you can still qualify as a trader business. Or, again, if you kind of meet that overarching real estate professional, I, I would just take it anyway and just say, well, it's, it's part of our larger real estate portfolio. And, again, you can make a grouping election for this as well to say, you've got to look at all my real estate activities together for purposes of these tests. So it's a really, I mean, it's, it's a really big, big number. I mean, I've, I, I saw clients get hundreds of thousands of dollars in deductions by being able to take that 20% haircut. So it's a big thing, and if you don't pay attention to it, uh, you, could, you could really miss the boat. If I have a live-in property manager, I can count her hours, correct? That's right, yeah, if, she's your, if you're contracting out to them. And I think, too, again, you, gotta look at, you wanna look at your real estate activities as a whole. I wouldn't look at each property individually and say which one counts and which one doesn't. Did you look at mine? <laughs> yeah, if, if you file the election. It can be aggregated if you file the election, say I wanna group everything together. It's, it's a separate grouping election from the real estate professional one. It's, it's just with respect to this, this QBI deduction. Um, the only other thing I would say is another, another change is like there, there are limitations on losses. So under old law, if I had a W-2 of made 500 grand and I, and that's a bad example. If I had a W-2 and I made a million dollars and I had a business that I lost a million dollars on, I could net the two together and I would pay no tax. Now you can only deduct 500,000 of what they call business losses on your personal return. The rest you have to carry forward. So the way that works is you add up all your in business income, you subtract all your losses. If you're in a net loss position and that loss is more than 500,000, you can, you can be limited. So just keep that in mind. I saw a couple people get tripped up by that. 
So I know I'm a little bit over, but let me just talk about a couple, couple best practices for folks. Um, again, keep good records. Like, do bookkeeping. Like, make sure you're ma making your business look like a legitimate trader business. Again, that's, that's one of the best things that you can do, especially in an audit situation, is to kind of, if it looks, if it looks like a business and you're treating it like a business, like the IRS is generally going to respect it. So make sure you're keeping good records. You know, file your tax returns. You know, make sure you're, you're being cognizant of, of payroll. Use a professional. Um, again, I, I, obviously, I'm, I, I'm in the business of, of preparing people's taxes, but I, I, again, I, I just, when I, when I get in a situation where I'm working with somebody, it's just, it's easy because you just see mistakes that are made and, you know, so many times, I had somebody come into my office the other day, pretty simple return, but they did TurboTax, they made a mistake, they, it cost them like a thousand bucks in taxes. And so, if you pay me 750 bucks and I save you a thousand bucks in tax, you're still $250 for the goods. So just keep that in mind. Um, I would say, um, you know, maintaining receipts, you know, try to make sure you're having that documentation, you know, you know, if you have statements, statements can be used in place of receipts, but you gotta, again, you know, there's, there's so many softwares and programs and things like that where you can like digitize stuff. Just make sure you're keeping good receipts. Um, try to keep up with stuff as you go too. I, I can't tell you how many times I run into people that like just wait to the last minute, you know, the, the procrastinator, right, that waits to the end of the year and tries to put everything together. You miss stuff, you know what I mean? So if you can keep up with stuff as you go, uh, you're gonna capture a lot more. And the more you capture, that's, when, I, when I, people come to me and say, hey, I just started a business, like what should I be thinking about, what should I be doing? The, the one thing I tell them all the time is that, that the hardest part is just capturing the data. If you capture the data, we can figure out what to do with it. But if you don't capture it, and you don't, I don't know about it, and you forget about it, then it's, it's lost money. Um, again, if you have payroll, make sure you're, you're, you're filing payroll tax returns and doing the deposit you need to. Sales tax, make sure you understand sales tax rules. Um, and that if you're, if you're subject to sales tax, that you're paying it. Um, if you have multiple properties, make sure you track those, those income and expenses by property. Because there are situations where if I dispose of a property, maybe there's some a benefit, some deductions I can get by just looking at each activity individually. And so try not to group everything together. Try to keep each property uh, maintained separately. Um, we talked about the aggregation rules a little bit. Other professionals, I mean, I, I, so even though Kurt makes fun of my golf game, he's just, I'll tell you what he's, he's upset about. I can hit the ball further than him, even though he's twice my size, and I think that's what bothers him. But <laughs> Kurt, Kurt's a great attorney, and there's, there's lots of great attorneys uh, here in, in York and Central Pennsylvania. You know, find, find a good attorney, especially when you come into things like leases and just buying real estate. And I mean, you, you can make so many mistakes along the way just because you try to do something yourself. And it's just, it's just not worth it at the end of the day. Um, insurance brokers, bankers, I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all your friends. You know what I mean? And, and so, what? You missed one. Real estate agent? Yeah, well, Realtor. I, I thought it was a given, Harry. Come on, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, surround yourself with, with good professionals. Um, you know, they'll save you lots of money in, in the long term. Um, I put a couple of like, things that I said in here, but, which I would say would be like tax breaks, loopholes. Hire family members, that's one thing that I've seen, seen people do. I mean, again, I, I wouldn't consider that to be like a big loophole. It's just like, hey, like, if you have somebody that it could legitimately do work for you, I've seen people put their children on the payroll, put their spouse on the payroll. Again, they have to be performing services. They have to keep like, time sheets, but if they're doing work, there, there's significant benefits to putting them on the payroll, having them be able to defer money into retirement, do whatever, so keep that in mind. This 14-day rental rule, a lot of people that are in real estate not only have like, you know, like, re like rentals here that they're, um, you know, producing income off of, but some people have like vacation rentals. Um, keep in mind if you, if you spend less than 14 days uh, in that vacation rental, you can still treat it as a, a you know, normal rental and get significant tax benefits. Uh, that 14 days, you know, going, taking trips to that vacation home to maintain it, things like that don't count towards that. So just make sure you're keeping uh, you know, good track and, and documenting that, that can be a nice way to, to get a nice vacation property. Um, stay away from related party sales, related party rentals. You can get tripped up on um, not being able to deduct, um, deduct losses. And just understanding those capitalization rules like we talked about, don't overcapitalize, just make sure you're being smart about um, what you're doing. Uh, sorry I ran over a little bit, I really appreciate the opportunity to come out. I think this is a great group and um, you know, I'll, I'll probably stick around at least for a little bit and maybe grab a beer. So if anybody wants to, to talk or whatever, happy to. And uh, my contact information is here. Harry has my contact information. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he'd be happy to pass along. And um, again, thank you for having me out and giving me the opportunity to speak to you all. Thank you.
job. Where's Jason go? You want to put ours back up? A lot of information, right? Some of it was a little complicated. Maybe got lost on some things, right? I, I, I did on some things. So all the more reason why you need a professional to, to you know, swim through that waters for you, that choppy waters. All successful people in real estate have a good team around them. And it doesn't matter if you're a realtor, wholesaler, flipper, or landlord. They all have a good team. We have a good lender. We have a good insurance agent. We have a good title company that specializes in investments. We have a good realtor who specializes in investments. And this is especially important. I hear so many stories of, of people who are working with an agent and they don't know anything about investment real estate. So I don't know why they wouldn't work with them. I really don't. Nothing against them, but if you don't, if you're an agent and you don't understand rental properties, you shouldn't list it. Or go to school and learn about rental real estate so you can be professional. I'll bet you almost everybody in here pulled off a listing out of the MLS or had an agent pull off a listing out of an MLS on a, let's say a three unit or more, two units are a lot of owner occupied, but on a three unit or more and no expenses are in the MLS report. How many times have we seen that? There's nothing more aggravating. Guess what, I gotta I got call the agent in. How much is this, how much is that? Well, I don't know, the seller wouldn't tell me, or they put zero for maintenance. And well, I wanna buy that property if there's zero maintenance, because I've never seen a property that requires zero maintenance, <laughs> let me tell you. So the point of that is, it's the same whether it's the insurance agent or the mortgage broker or the CPA, they should be well-versed in real estate because that's our business work with pros. They're gonna make you money. They're gonna put, help push you to the top. I'm gonna uh, go over some statistics. Who likes statistics? I like statistics. All right, here we go. People under 35 years make up 35% of homeowners. True or false? True. Tell him what he's won, Bob. The average price of luxury homes have fallen 15% between 2018 and 2019. True or false? That is true, too. More than 90% of homeowners are 65 years or older. I made that one too easy. <laughs> On average, a homeowner takes 60 to 90 days to buy a property. 30 to 45 days. What percentage of homeowners are predicted to comprise 33% of the market in 2019? Yeah, I screwed that up. First time home buyers are predicted to compromise 33% of the market in 2019, that's true. We're gonna skip that one. Homes that are staged sell 25% faster, true or false? True. Only 15% of homeowners regret buying instead of renting. It's 8%. So most people still are glad they bought the house. Over 90%, that's pretty good, right? I think. Millennials have 45% of all US mortgages in 2019. I would say false, but it's true. I didn't think it was that high. A 
The highest home ownership rate is in the Midwest at 68%. True or false? True. True. A lot of people in the Midwest own their own homes. The number of renters age 60 plus grew 43% between 2007 and 2017. True. Married people make up 70% of all homeowners. False. 63%. And my favorite statistic at all, 64.4% of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> this is our, uh, Dave messed with my slides. I went down to Apple the other day to buy a car. Who hates buying cars? First of all, the whole process. Raise your hands. Who hates buying cars, right? So I said to uh, the guy, I told him what I want. He says, oh, I got a beauty for you. You're going to love her. And we're walking out to the car. I said, well, why you call her a her? Why don't you ever call a car him? We said, cars are like women. How? He said, well, in the morning when it's really cold and you really need her, they won't turn over either. All righty. <laughs> Today, we're the people because of the choices we made yesterday. A lot of people blame the circumstances for the reason they're not more successful. Maybe they don't own enough properties. Maybe they didn't get that job. But a lot of it is the choices they made that day. So just remember that when you're with your kids and you're trying to encourage them, you're trying to motivate them, uh, especially teenagers, that the choices they make today could impact the rest of their life. I need to show this to my wife. <laughs> Most people do not listen with the intent to understand they listen with the intent to reply. If we're disagreeing on something, I can see it in her eyes. She's not even listening to me. She's thinking of how she wants to reply to me. Uh, and a lot of people do this. I do it sometimes, too. And it, you, you can train yourself to listen. And as salespeople, and we're all salespeople, we need to become better listeners. We need to be able to, to hear exactly what they're saying and why they're saying it and the reflection in their voice. We might think we know what their, their, their intent is or their meaning is, but you really got to listen to them. And listen to them fully before you even think of trying to reply or, or what to say. And that is part of the problem with the internet with, and with texting. You don't really know the meaning of what someone's texting you sometimes because one little phrase at the end or the beginning or in the middle of that sentence could change the whole outlook of what, what they're trying to uh, impress upon you. I got a, uh, saw this a long time ago at a seminar and the instructor wrote, I didn't say he stole the money. Just, I didn't say he stole the money. Now he said that sentence can mean four different things based on the phrase. I didn't say he stole the money. Somebody else did. I didn't say he stole the money. I didn't say he stole the money. And the last one, I didn't say he stole the money, which implied he stole something else. Same sentence, four different meanings. That's why I hate text and emails when I'm trying to negotiate with people. You just can't understand where they're coming from. Right, Michael? Absolutely. 
it's tough. It makes it tough. Uh, when we, we, before we had all that, it was just much easier. Pick up the phone, you could call them, you could talk to them, right? It made it easier because you could understand what, what the phrase and where they're coming from. So you watch that and see if it doesn't happen in the next week or two in your life. That something got misconstrued a little bit, taken out of context just because it was an email or a text. You know, the old way is still the best way. A lot of times, two people can be disagreeing on something, and they're both right. Especially when you're dealing with family. So whether it's family or in business, be a little careful on standing your ground too hard, because sometimes you're both right. Anybody have any properties they want to sell? Any wholesale deals out there? Nobody? What do you got? Um, I just listed one at 7957. I'll have to double check. Is that a, is it a wholesale deal? So it's retail? Or, or, yeah. yeah. We have a after hours networking lounge right over here. So don't everybody just run out. This is where you get a chance to get over there, mingle, talk to people, get to know people, uh, pick up some tips, rub elbows. Anybody have any questions before we wrap it up? Nobody has any questions? This is a very knowledgeable group. <laughs> Again, I want to thank Kevin Eisenhart for coming out tonight, sharing us his time and expertise, getting us a little bit better, better educated in the real estate field so we can go out and do better in our job and make more money. So uh, I will see you guys next month. And don't forget Thursday night in Harrisburg if you uh, missed last month. Thanks for coming. Tune in next time to the Central Pennsylvania Real Estate Investors Meetup Podcast, keeping you up to date with what is happening in the York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania real estate markets.